On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Sarah visits the studio of a North Carolina guitar and ukulele maker, while Roger uses acrylics and paints a portrait of the craftsman at his workbench. This building is the home of Lichty Guitar, and we're going to meet Jay Lichty. He's a luthier, a fine instrument maker, makes beautiful guitars and ukuleles. And following our time with Jay, Roger's going to paint a character study of him at his workbench. Hello, Jay. Hey, Sarah. How are you? Great. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah. It's fun to come to your shop here and try on North Carolina and see how you put the wood to use. Well, it's what I do. Now, this is small, so what, what instrument would this now be? This, that'll be for uh, an ukulele that I'm building now, a little tenor-sized uh, ukulele. I call them ukuleles because I'm you know, from the Carolinas. Yes. And I've been gotten in trouble for that in the past because the, the correct pronunciation is ukulele. Ukulele. But... Um, Anyway, so this is going to be a tenor ukulele. Yes, on the front you've got beautiful wood, beautiful grain, and then this is the abalone? Yeah, that's abalone. Uh, comes from the sea, you know, from shells. Well, they use that in jewelry making. Exactly. And this is a piece of redwood, and you, and you can see it's got some real nice figure to it that uh, kind of gives it three dimensions, curly redwood. Mm -hmm. And the back is actually, and the sides will be out of cocobola, which is a, a Mexican hardwood. Is this reinforcement, or yeah. does this do with sound? Well, both. This is, this is spruce uh, on this instrument, and it, you know, the, the, they're braces. And they also help you transmit the, the sound in a ways to give it different uh, qualities tonally. I know that you're also a musician, mm -hmm. and um, I see you have a hole <clears throat> in the side of the instrument, and I'm thinking you probably did that on purpose. You're so. talking about this? Yes. This is a side sound port, and a couple of things it does is it allows the musician, the player, to actually hear the sound projecting up as opposed to it coming just out of the front of an instrument, and it also allows the instrument to breathe, uh, because as the as the strings are plucked, it, it actually the vibrations make the top move up and down, which creates a, a pump really? effect. So air. So if I were to strum on this and you held your hand over that, you can hear. You can probably feel some air movement. Yes, I can. Let's look at this other interesting instrument. It's got six strings. This is actually a little parlor guitar. It'll have a ni nylon strings. I'm in the process of just put it together yesterday. Well, in the stages of building, you have um, the top and you've got the bottom, but how do you put this on the body of the of what you're making? Well, I just happen to have the body right okay. here. How <laughs> handy is that? Very. <laughs> so um, the body is basically a mold that just holds this body in the shape after I bend the wood. I put it in and hold it to shape and glue in the block and these linings. And, and the linings, which is the light-colored wood, is actually what... I'll actually put glue on, and then the top and the back will, will then be clamped on and, and glued on. Right here, that's actually my own personal one, and it has a similar top in that it's, it's, the, it's like this redwood. This one's actually going to be a little fancier, but it has this nice curl going on with it, and this is a, a piece of uh, Southeast Asian rosewood. That's absolutely incredible. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I noticed that these strings seem to be farther apart than many I have seen. That's a, yeah, very observant. That, they, they are. They're further apart. The neck is a little bit wider. This actually, this neck is a little bit longer than a typical tenor ukulele, which this, this is. It sounds like there are many ways you can customize this for your customers. I can, and, and that's uh, it's one of the beauties of, 
of this craft is being able to get people exactly what there's such a um a personal instrument any instrument musical instrument is personal to the person person playing it is this a tiny plane it is it's a little finger plane that comes in very handy I'd like to look around the workshop and just see some of the other stations and some of the other equipment that you use. Sure, I'll introduce you to the little man that runs that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> are these some other shapers? Well, these are forms that I use for gluing and building. This one waiting to have the neck piece put on? Yeah, that, that one's actually, it's curing. It's in the finishing stage where the finish has been sprayed on and then there's a period of time where it has to sit and just cure to draw it to harden. Jay, if you want to take lessons in guitar making, do you give them? I do, yes. I do a one-on-one -on -one class here in the shop, and it's about a, it's a 10-day class, and you walk away with a guitar. Really? Yeah. In 10 days? Well, <laughs> it's done in 10 days. I have to put the finish on and let it cure, and then I send mm -hmm. it off. So I don't, I don't teach finishing. I just teach the guitar building. And so you can assemble it, you can choose the wood and... Mm -hmm. Do the whole thing, yeah. I had no idea yeah. um, you could produce one in that period of time. Of course, well, that's it's not the finished it's, product. But. It's not the finished product and, and there's some, some preliminary stuff that goes in, but yeah, it's, sure. it's, it's, um, it's like anything. Once you, if you know, if you got someone telling you how to do it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little quicker than just trying to figure it out yourself. Oh. I've learned so much. I really appreciate your well, time. Well, thanks for coming. I'm, I've had fun. No, it's been great. Well, portraits offer more of a challenge than landscapes in many respects, because in a landscape, things can change a bit, but on a portrait, pretty much has to look like the person. But one way to simplify a portrait like this is to put some backlighting behind the subject. That eliminates quite a bit of the detail here in the front, and it also gives it a more of a dramatic look. I'm using acrylics today, and on my palette I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, I have a purple, alizarin crimson, cadmium red light, Indian yellow, and three earth colors of yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and burnt umber. This is a 9 by 12 inch piece of masonite covered with gesso, and just to save some time, I made a preliminary drawing on paper and I transferred it here to the board. I'm going to start with my darks. First, here, I just want a very dark color, dark value, and I'm just going to put this in the background. Oh, and when I toned my board, I used this blue color up here, and I used a warmer tone down here, sort of to reflect the photograph itself. And I want to cut in very carefully around his face. These other parts don't matter quite as much. And I'm using a large brush just so I can cover it very quickly. And we do have my atomizer here. This is really important. Not only keeps my acrylic paints wet, but every once in a while I can spray my board and it helps me move this paint around my, my board a little bit easier. Okay, well, we won't worry about the background too much. After I put paint on like that, I can take my brush, wipe it off, and if I need to smooth this out some, I can just smooth it out with a light touch. I'm almost applying this as if it were a watercolor to start with. Just blocking in these simple tones. I'll wash my brush out. Now I'll mix a tone for his face. Purple and yellow ochre often make a good uh, skin tone. Now right on the side here, that's where the, that's where the backlighting will be. And that's what will give this painting a more dramatic look. I'm painting this quite thin because I don't want to lose my drawing here. Now, on, especially on the face here, I want to be careful that I don't get a lot of rough brush marks like in here. I want to keep this nice and smooth. So I lay that on there and with a very light touch, I'll bring that down so I don't get a lot of that odd texture in his face. I'll pick up my same color here and I'll put that on his part of his hand. Okay, so this table is quite light, so I'm going to have to add some white in here because I've already got this sort of a warm yellow tone. And whenever I add white to something, it makes it opaque. Now, if it's thin enough, I'm going to see any paint through there, any paint underneath, but basically it's going to make things opaque. It's not a lot of color down in this area. Now, even though painting portraits are quite a bit more difficult than painting a landscape in, in many respects. 
it's really all about the shapes and the colors and the values. So I try to think of this not so much as a portrait, but just as another shape. That is hair back here, which is very dark. Now that hair is going to really blend in with the background, but for now I want to keep that edge in sight. I don't want to lose this edge here yet, because I want to be sure I get the shape of his head as correct as I can before I go in and start losing any edges. Well, that covers the canvas, and that's my first and primary goal of any painting, is to get everything covered, pretty much everything covered. So now I can start to go back and begin to refine some of these areas. So with my ultramarine blue and maybe some burnt umber, a little purple, purple maybe, I'll get these dark areas in here of his shirt. It's actually a, a very bright blue shirt, but I think I may add a little warmth to that by adding some purple to it. Let's jump down here where the uh, bottom of this guitar is being put on this template here. He used some beautiful woods when he built these guitars. Again, I'm just using this thin paint, applied fairly thin. If I were using canvas, I might have to use thicker paint, but on the masonite, uh, thinner paint does not look bad at all. Thin paint on canvas often does look a little, little weak, and I will apply more paint as I go along, especially in the areas that are have a lot of light on them. And I'm just going slowly and carefully here and building it up as I as I proceed. A little warm color once again. Put it on this guitar where he is using a chisel to sculpt the instrument. I don't want to do very much detail in any one area at any one time. Now, a little bit later on, of course, the concentration will be on the head and on the hands. But for now, just getting in the basics to see whether it all works together. If I need to make some changes, now is the time to do it, not later on after I've spent a lot of time putting in detail in one area or another. Ultramarine blue and burnt umber. Make this hair darker. A little more burnt umber in there than blue. Larger brush once again. I want to start to block this background out so it's not interfering with anything going on down here. So I'm going to pick up my ultramarine blue again and some purple. Some, just make this a very, very dark color and go over this one more time. Acrylics don't always cover very well on the first go around. And like I said earlier, I just want to establish my tones and values right off the bat without using a lot of thick paint. If you're right-handed, it's always a good idea to have your palette on your right-hand side. If you're left-handed, on your left-hand side. But if I were to have my palette over here on the left, and uh, every time I were to get into the paint, I would have to move over here. I also like to keep my palette quite close to where I'm painting. Some of those little things that make a big difference when painting. Also, when the palette is close, it makes it a lot easier to match your colors. Well, I think I'll begin to work on this face. I'll take some purple, yellow ochre, and also with my spray bottle, I'll spray his face slightly. That will make this acrylic paint flow over the dry paint easier. It's time to work on the face a little more. So with my purple and the um, yellow ochre, I'll make that flesh tone again. And just this time I'll apply that and make it slightly more opaque. Now it's very subtle here because since this is backlit, there's not a lot of hard changes in here. There's those few darker tones right under his eyes. Picking up a small pointed brush and I'll put the highlight in right on the side of his face now. Now in a photograph, all that light area is getting washed out. It's getting bleached out by the photograph. In real life, it wouldn't be that bleached out. So I'm going to add a warmth to that. Just a touch of yellow ochre. Put 
that right on the side of his face. And that just may be too bright, but I'm not sure. I think I'll spray this first. And maybe a touch of red in there. We'll drag that highlight right down across his face. Right under his eyelid. And there's his cheek. Now these bright areas, these just blend right up into his hair here. So I'll take that same color, but I'll thin it out. And with a larger brush, I'll take this color here and I'll flip it out into this dark area. Make that nice soft edge there where his hair is, where the light is shining through his hair. Now that looks way too bright to me right now, but I think maybe when I add this bright color to his shirt, that may change the look of things. So let's try that. Make some ultramarine blue and white. And we'll put some of those same bright highlights on the edge of his shirt. Okay, and I'll give this another spray of water. And then the shirt gets darker as it comes down this way. Some of the light starts to drop off. You see, as I brighten this, as I brighten these blues, it doesn't make that look quite so harsh. It's still quite harsh, but uh, we'll keep working with it here. Oh, and we have a very nice patch of light coming right across his shoulder on the back. I think at this point I'll lose the back of his head back here, sort of blend that into the background. So I'll take my dark colors again, give that a little spray. Here's his hair, and there's the background. I'm just going to lose that whole area right in here. Now, when doing a portrait like this, I did take a number of photographs of Jay. I just moved around slightly. I got the light where I wanted it, then I moved around, because I didn't want to get any odd tangents or anything like that in the, in the painting. So I had probably a dozen photographs to choose from. Some had more light on his hands and so on. Another nice thing about working with digital photographs and using a laptop, computer, or a device such as a tablet is that uh, I have the ability to zoom in on my subject and see it a lot more clearly than had I printed a photograph out and worked from a photograph. So whenever I can, I like to work from my laptop computer. So I've zoomed in here on Jay's face. Now I can add a few of those details. I'm going to try and keep it as simple as I can. I'll add some alizarin crimson to this mix. Here's his lips down here. Of course, I don't want to get them very red, but I do want to, don't want them to be a cold color either. Now one area of the face that's always very warm is the ear because the light will shine through that part of the ear and that will always have a warm color to it. I'll take my razor blade and clean my palette. Cleaning my palette will just help to keep me from muddying my colors. It's a pure cerulean blue. This is very bright right up here near his cheek. That light is hitting that shirt and his cheek at the same time there. Right here, this very dark area under his chin almost blends right in with his shirt. So I'll put some blue up in there because there'll be some uh, reflected light from his shirt bouncing up onto his cheek. Now some of these things I can see in my photograph, some subtle things like this I really can't see, but I know they do exist, and I could probably see them much better in real life. Here are three other character studies I've completed recently. I painted this with a lot of cool tones in his shirt and otherwise warm tones down here. This was kept very dark because I wanted the hot iron to show up quite well. And the one way to accomplish that is to have dark against light. So all this around the anvil was very dark. And then this light yellow showed up quite vividly. Now this painting here was done totally in acrylics. This is another painting of a, a Florida 
pioneer. He was at a uh, pioneer festival, and he was demonstrating a lot of the tools and such that people would have been using during the 1800s. And I think this is my favorite painting here. This was a man we saw up in Delaware. Uh, he was sort of the town character, and I think he was of Indian heritage, and I just loved the way his face looked, and especially his eyes. Now on Jay's portrait, I started to draw that very accurately because it's of a particular individual and I didn't want to stray too far from his actual character. But this piece I began just by using a brush and no pencil. I just sketched this out with a paintbrush and began from there. Now these two paintings here were begun with acrylics and then they were finished with oils because I needed to have some more blending time in these faces, the acrylics just dried too quickly for me to blend that to my satisfaction. So that's what I'm going to do here with the guitar maker. I'm going to put out some oil paints and we'll finish this painting in oils. Okay, I have my oil paints put out now right down here and I will start mixing some of that flesh tone. I believe I'll take my purple and my yellow ochre and maybe a touch of red with some white. And I'll warm up these tones in this face. I'm also able to put some more detail in here. It just seemed a bit too dark before. And now with these oils, I can put these on there and then I can blend those colors together much easier than if I were using the acrylics. We'll move down to his hand. I'll do the same thing to his hand. Put in some of these light tones. And I'll warm that up, some of these shadow areas with a bit of red right in here. Maybe a touch of red on his lips. And I'll finish this with some dark colors and detail right on his eyebrows and eyelid. There, that brightens up his face some. Okay, I'm going to move down here and finish these areas right here where he was working on the guitar. With the warm color of burnt sienna, burnt umber, I think I'll start by putting in these chisels right here. Move over here, got a darker shadow need a dark shadow under his hand because that uh, light is coming from behind him. So everything is lit from behind. So this is casting a shadow right across the instrument. And I'll drag this lighter area around that template he's working with. I load my brush up quite a bit with paint. That way I can make this stroke go quite far without having to pick up more paint. When it comes to this point in the painting, painting really slows down quite a bit. It's, uh, this is all about the detail at this point. I've got the values in where I want them and I've got all my colors, I think, adjusted fairly well. So now it's just these little touches that will finish the painting. These finishing touches are very important, but it's not nearly as important as getting these other large shapes down first. If I don't, no matter how much detail I add later, it won't, uh, won't help the painting if the foundation of the painting has not been uh, thought out beforehand. Thinking out the first part of this painting is the most important part, not the detail. And I know it's really fun. Everybody, including myself, wants to get into the detail right away, but there's a, there's a real danger of putting in too much detail at the beginning. Whenever I do that, I always uh, regret it. I'm going to pick up some Indian yellow, and I'm going to put in some more color right down here on the instrument. And I could use a bit larger brush, pick up some of that on my brush and just carry it down into these other areas. I'm putting in more color here than I see in my photograph, but 
as I said earlier, anytime I use a photograph, the color has been washed out considerably from what I would see had I been there in real life. So I am adding some color to that. The camera just does not have that, what's called the dynamic range between lights and darks nearly as much as our eyes do. And that's one good reason for painting outside. You can really see so much more detail than we can when we're working from a photograph. Well, I'm going to take a chance here and try and put in a hint of detail in the very back where he has his benches and tools. Now, if I don't like this, I can just take some mineral spirits and wipe this out because this here is acrylics. It's already dry and it would be easy to wipe this out. So I'll just put a hint of a cabinet or two. I'm keeping this dark back here and very neutral in color, very gray, because I don't want this to jump out in any way to take away from my main subject. Here's a cabinet right here. Just suggest that. Hope you can see this on the uh, video because this is quite, quite subtle right here. Well, I think I should stop on this background. I don't want to get too carried away. It's very easy to get carried away on anything like this. And by adding too much, it can very easily destroy what I've already uh, accomplished. Well, I think those soft, subtle details in the background will bring this painting to a conclusion of Jay Litke, the guitar maker. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.